Shota Ijima was just an ordinary boy, living an ordinary life. That is, until he found some random storybook on the riverbank three years ago. Little did he know at the time that this book would awaken something sinister deep inside of him. Why, you ask? Well, that's because merely opening the book automatically disrobes him. And to add to that, its contents are so out of this world that he's chosen to worship it and call it Erohan Sama. Inside is a full-blown harem filled to the brim with willing, luscious ladies. And to give proper justice to this work of art, our boy celebrates his 1,000th straight day of being in a committed relationship with his right hand. That must be tiring, you think, but not for him. Dinging the dong is just like breathing to him by now, second nature. They say everything comes and goes. Well, he definitely does. So whether it's the 2,000th or 10 millionth day, he wholeheartedly swears to continue his daily devotion to Erohan Sama via his devious ways. But the main issue is that he must preserve the book's cleanliness. With his projectiles flying further than expected, and the distance growing due to the recoil from the power of his heavy artillery, he realizes that no human reflex could possibly spare the book from eternal damage. What he does is he closes it so that only the cover gets messed up. Shockingly, this results in the book glowing ever so brightly. And with that, he's gotten isekai At least it ain't truck coon this time. He now finds himself in a jail cell alongside other children. When he approaches these foreigner-looking kids, they look back at him with disdain. After all, his unmentionables are in full display. But it's not the time to care about that now. He tries to talk to them in an unknown language, only for the kids to give him puzzled looks. Is it a language barrier? But no, they trash talk him in Japanese. This makes things easier. So after Shoda awkwardly introduces himself, he asks why these boys are imprisoned. And yes, the irony behind his name and current situation isn't lost on me. One of them says his name is Carl. Apparently, they're all here in this slave house in the capital city as merchandise to be sold. He then asks if Shoda's a wizard. After all, the boy appeared from a bright light out of nowhere. This has Shoda joyously remembering how he activated his powers, only to realize that he's in a different world. Instead of being stoked, Shoda is devastated. Erohan Sama, where are you? He shuffles around the room, desperately looking for his most prized possession to no avail. Oh no, without it, Shoda Jr. can't go to school anymore. If you're wondering how all this looks to Carl, the word is cringe. All of a sudden, an old, noble-looking man appears from outside the cell. Judging by his appearance and escorts, this guy might be pretty important. Without giving him any form of clothing, they pull Shota to a room where he's faced with the slave merchant Budageha. The noble observes his unusual features, black eyes, hair, and a different skin tone. The oldie comes to the conclusion that he isn't from this country. Puzzled, Shota asks what country they're even in. Budegaha seems to have taken extreme offense to the fact that the boys oblivious to the existence of the Dragon Empire, the ones that united the entirety of the elven continent. Nope, still doesn't ring a bell. Shota judges the empire for its weeby name and fires back another question. Do the people here know about Japan? That confused expression tells him what he needs to know. Well, the slave merchant shrugs the question off. With the boy's rare characteristics, he can demand a higher sum of money. When the boy wonders where he's being brought, the man explains that they're headed to the continent's biggest funhouse for women and hell for men, the Valhalla Ding Dong Mansion. The guards put him in a jail-like carriage alongside Carl, and they begin their journey to the destination. When asked what the mansion's like, Carl explains that it's a funhouse that belongs to the kingdom. It houses male products chosen by their royal highness. And when they've been chosen, they're announced as a royal concubine. Shota inquires why the king would need a dude, to which Carl mentions that the top figure, Annalise, is a young woman. Not just her, actually. All the important people in high-up positions are female, from the guards, ministers, captains, soldiers, wizards, and clerics. Not just in the Dragon Empire, but this entire continent sees men as nothing but tools for satisfaction and reproduction. Oh, how the turns have tabled. In any case, that's why boys like them get used as entertainment toys. As Shota looks outside, he confirms if their customers are all women. Carl tries to calm him down, but say yes to his answer at the same time. Surprisingly for him, Shota begins laughing mischievously in the corner. To many of the boys there, this may be their most harrowing nightmare, but to Shota, this is his dream. His once quiet snickers crescendo into maniacal laughter. Jackpot! He puts himself on full display as the passersby observe his dangling assets. And to add to that, everyone on the street was a character from the book he was reading. Screw Japan. This is Valhalla. They finally arrive at the mansion, with Shota fully determined to become someone in this world. Welcoming them are several ladies in maid outfits, with a very energetic one standing at the center. She's Charlotte, the head maid here. 
Her thunderous voice reminds them that once they pass through these gates, there is no escape. The vice head, Johanna, confirms if only five boys are coming today. They do their count and eventually point their affections towards our rare species, Shota, and his lack of clothing. Charlotte asks why he's crying. Little does she know that those are tears of joy. Though she's initially stunned by his features, she eventually realizes that he's really cute. Her flustered expression gives off more than she'd like, but our boy's too conscious of this pretty lady and her presence's effects on his extremities to notice. Anyway, she pulls him to the bath area. He needs to have a bath before meeting the director, after all. Unbeknownst to each other, they both have sinister intentions. Charlotte makes sure to slyly torment him there in the most maddening ways, almost pushing Shota to the edge. She asks him to call her Char, and our boy's brain melts into total simp mode. Oh, he'll do more than that. If she wants his boy berries, he'll serve them on a silver platter. But before things can escalate further, though, they're distracted by screams of help from the other side of the bath. It's Johanna, forcing Carl to eat some of her product. Shota can't believe what he's seeing. It's truly a sight to behold. Charlotte reminds her vice head to take it easy on the newbies, to which the latter refuses, saying that they'd better get used to it quickly. Carl is nearly passed out from suffocation, but it seems that Shota's also dying, from jealousy. That should be him. And to this I say, that should have been me. With that, our heroic boy calls for the vice head's attention and shyly tries to save his newfound friend. When Johanna catches wind of his intentions, she commands him to take Carl's place, but shockingly for them, he excitedly obliges. He even prepares his best position for the job. It's my first time, so please do it slowly. All the maids are shocked, and Johanna enters another plane of existence. Both her and Shota are glad to be alive at this very moment. Our boy thanks his flute lessons back in the day for providing his mouth with the necessary dexterity for this day. He's been practicing with his imagination all along. Charlotte thinks that this world unfairly turns men into playthings, and as such, she must protect Shota from this tragedy. But when he's able to make the legendary Johanna scream like a first-timer, she can't help but wonder who he really is. It's another day, but this one's quite special. It's time for Shota to meet the mansion's director. Two women jest that they hope the new boy won't go crazy from this place's hardcore rules, but maybe they'll get more than what they bargained for. In another room, Char excitedly dresses Shota up in a bathrobe. While it's definitely comfortable, it's kinda odd to be meeting such an important person with his dongle dangling around. He soon enters and finds a blessed woman welcoming him, alongside a more childlike figure. The former introduces herself as Ursula, the director of this Valhalla mansion. Oh boy, she's ticking all his boxes here. He can't wait to lay his hands on her. God, he could feel the shield hero about to rise again. While the other boys nervously quiver in their seats, Shoda stands out from the rest. He redirects his attention towards the girl beside the director. She's just grabbing snacks from a tub when she points her gaze at him. She praises Ursula for the outfit choice of bathrobes so she can peek at their blind items. Happy as can be, she looks towards Shota, who effortlessly smiles and waves back. Budegaha screams at him to show some respect, but before he can say who she is, she cuts him off and reprimands him for speaking out of line. The old man begs for her forgiveness. Still trying to make light of the situation, Shota raises his hands to ask a question. Firstly, what's her name? She initially makes a mistake, but reveals herself to be Hilda. How old? 500. Er, she means, the Roman numerals X, I, I. When asked if her horn is the real deal, she lets him touch and stroke it. She's genuinely pleased to find someone who isn't terrified of her. For Dragonkin, someone touching their horns is more embarrassing than any other part of the body, and he's just doing it without a care in the world. But then, Hilda asks herself why she's even letting him touch her horn. Before she can do some introspection, Ursula cuts them both off. Hilda refuses to accept a loss and grabs Shota's Tralala. But wait, is he really... You know, his name? Because why the hell does it feel like an elephant trunk? As for Shota, our boy's in cloud nine. This is the first time someone's, uh, shaken hands with him. But wait, the one who did that to him is Hilda, a lolicorn. Does that make him a lolicorn? He denies it at first, only to decide that maybe he is. And what about it? Meanwhile, Hilda can't believe what she's holding on to. It feels like a legendary sword from the folk tales. To confirm, she pulls his robe off and exposes him to the other maids. It was at this moment that everyone was introduced to the legend, the Dovahkiin, or Dragonborn. A boy born with the armaments of a mythical creature, even Ursula's smitten by his weapon. Shoda nervously tries to hide it, while Hilda laughs her brains out. She lets Ursula know that it's time to wrap up negotiations. Ursula announces that everyone, except Shoda, is worth 100 gold coins each. That's fair. Shoda begins panicking that maybe he wasn't sold, 
But for him, Ursula makes an offer of a hundred thousand gold coins, an unspeakable offer that rattles even Budegaha to the very core. A thousand times more? Moreover, the amount will be paid in full right away. Shota wonders how he could possibly have been a thousand times more expensive than the undoubtedly handsome Carl. Anyway, the transaction achieves completion with a happy slave trader walking away a rich man. Hilda announces to the boy that he'll be hers from today till the next three years. That's an indisputable decision. Oh, happy days. But at the end of those three years, he'll surely be a great product slash service, serve all the women here well in that time frame, and she swears to grant him any wish that he wants. As Hilda and Ursula walk down the hall, they discuss the sight that's clearly imprinted into their minds. It was an absolutely lethal weapon on a planetary scale, the object of dreams, the Dragon Slayer, a magical item that can alter course of history. In this world, ordinary men wield swords the size of an index finger, but Shota's is easily twice that. To add to that, when fully ready for battle, his thing's just as solid as Mithril. Ursula comments that even the usually calm and collected Hilda lost her marbles at the sight of that. Anyway, the latter comments that he'll be working as an entertainer for three years. Women all over the world should flock in droves to experience his weapon. And, if all these women give birth to offspring, then it should alleviate their population issues. So his first order of business is to get ten women to give birth. Now in the confines of his room, Shota looks forward to pushing Hilda to the very brink. While he would have preferred the more mature Ursula, there is no such thing as a loss here. He remembers her words that even if they don't expect much for him, hopefully he does his best. His thoughts are interrupted by a knock on the door. It's Charlotte. She wants to talk. Our boy entertains his guest with a nice cup of tea, but we all know that she isn't here for the tea. She's here for his fourth letter of the alphabet. They both look at each other, and the tension between them is so thick you could cut it with a knife. Just to be sure, Shota checks that he's turned off the CCTV crystal sheltered at the corner of the room. While this is happening, visions of his nuclear missile can't seem to leave Charlotte's mind. She's in the mood now. What throws her off, though, is that Shota shows no signs of fear or hesitation. Does he not know what she intends to do to him? Oh, girl, trust us. He knows. Pushing that aside, she starts making up her excuse. As the headmaid, it's her job to make sure that all the boys are healthy. Thus, she must conduct regular taste tests of his byproducts for a whole month. Damn, a taste test. She gonna make a short about it too? Shoda, on the other hand, can't believe what he just heard. Surely it's a lie. He even trembles at the idea. He shakes nervously, but that's actually him being over the moon. He's just trying to hide how overjoyed he is, especially considering how differently they perceive the situation. She sees this as a boot camp. He sees this as paradise. And if previously he asked her for tips, now she's asking for his tip. Will she do a good job? He's kind of insecure since he isn't as good looking as the other boys, but he pulls out the secret weapon. Its size is enough to put stars in Charlotte's eyes. Arise. Those stars turn into hearts instantly. Without further ado, the maid gets to her business. Shoda's overwhelmed not only by her skill, but how different it feels from his usual routine. It's clear that while he's having the time of his life, she's enjoying this too. More than five minutes later, the job is complete and Shota's so happy that he gives her a hug. He wants to do more of this, and that's why she promises to check his anointments every morning. This elicits a delighted reaction from our resident degenerate. He even says he loves her, and she reciprocates it. Does that mean anything? We don't know. But hey, now he receives not one but two free services in one day. Before he knows it, he's already in the mansion's massive cafeteria for lunch. This elegant place can easily seat a thousand people, and the food isn't anything to scoff at either. However, instead of marveling at the generous facilities, our boy's head is still in the clouds. He's all hung up over the morning's events. It's only his first day, but he's looking forward to so much more. That lights the flame of resolve to work hard and move up the ladder. He then notices Carl on the other side of the room. The boy's clearly gotten the life drained out of him. Even when he greets his friend, Carl can only muster a pained response. It's only been a day at work, Carl, but we get you. He comments on how Shota's still so lively in man. He truly is built different. Shota misunderstands the comment as a physical remark, noting how he finds his Eastern features inferior to the other boy's more Western ones. Anyway, he enthusiastically mentions how he's looking forward to servicing all the ladies and working hard to satisfy his customers. Carl mentions that his optimism has made him the center of attention. Before he can continue, a commotion stirs up at the cafeteria's entrance. Barging in is a well-dressed youth that people refer to as Mikhail Sama. The guy has an arrogant grin on his face, giving off the aura of a spoiled noble. He walks up to Shota, who couldn't care less about what's going on here. 
Expectedly, Mikael blasts him for being overhyped, as his black hair is the only thing going for him. He's short, small-eyed, and definitely not worth the 100,000 gold. Whoa, buddy. Slow down there. Considering these are all pain points for Shoda, he gets annoyed, but he just keeps eating. One of the ladies raises her voice at him for being disrespectful. How dare he keep eating in the presence of Mikal? The arrogant boy demands his name, but Shoda reminds him that it's rude to ask for someone's name without giving yours first, ticking the guy off. And with that, Mikal formally introduces himself as the best product here in the Valhalla mansion. Shoda just says his name, then asks how much Mikal got sold for. He must be a prized commodity to walk around with that kind of arrogance, right? Well, 1,000 gold coins. But at the time, that was the highest price people were ever going to pay. Shoda notices that this guy is just insecure. That's why he tries to appeal to Mikael's softer side by explaining that someone's price doesn't determine their true worth. At the end of the day, the most important thing is to remain prideful in their jobs, satisfy their customers, and remain professional. Mikael angrily slams the table while screaming, how can they be proud of such a job? Shoda nonchalantly responds that he's just here to satisfy the customer, he isn't a hero or whatever. Mikael, appearing to be extremely passionate about this topic, reminds him that all women here are savage beasts. Any newbie would be crying in the corner by the end of the day. Shoda just looks at him with a blank expression. This leads Mikael to remember something and ask his assistant what day it is today. It's Saturday. Upon hearing this, he laughs in a comically loud manner and lets Shoda know that it'd be best not to get picked by the notorious newbie crusher. And with that, he walks away. In the lobby, a short-haired lady strategizes her approach. She knows she's just one of today's hungry customers, so she can more or less see what other people will be picking. Unlike their conventional choices, she knows she's a bit peculiar. Her dark secret is she loves tormenting the fresher boys, the newbies, until they're completely exhausted and have nothing left to give. She's able to release her pent-up stress by bullying these poor youths and letting them know how bad they are at their job, which has led to her nickname, the Newbie Crusher. Watch out, boys. Imperial Guard Mercedes is here for you. Shoda excitedly goes to the display cages, eager to begin his first day of work. The mansion is now open for business. He admires the women coming in. They're all beautiful, but Carl looks on in disgust as they're all sick in the head. He's been through really rough treatment at the hands of his handlers. Since they're one of the lowest on the totem pole at level human, they're extremely cheap, but aren't allowed to go all the way. Shoda sees multiple women that are his type, but they aren't picking him. Things are looking real bleak. That's until Mercedes asks him to show her his face. She's fascinated by his black hair and chooses him as a result. The sight of this cool female knight excites Shoda as he willingly walks down the hall with her. This causes Charlotte to run to the director's office, reporting that Shoda could be in trouble. After all, he was chosen by the infamous newbie crusher who's destroyed more than 20 of her boys. But they can't do anything about it except hope that Shoda will survive this ordeal. If only they could see the Cheshire Awe grin on his face. He gets strong S vibes from her, and he's looking forward to all the rough treatment she's going to bestow upon him. She's quite similar to the materials he has in his books. And god dang, she's got rumps and bumps for days. Life is so good, Shoda can't help but cry. He's finally about to have a rodeo with a dommy mommy. This is when Mercedes notices that Shoda's clinging on to her. Isn't he afraid since he's new? Plus, he's looking cheery, which leads her to believe that he hasn't been raised in a normal family. Man, the Ajima family's catching strays for Shoda's degeneracy. Oh well, it doesn't matter. She'll be using that method. They'll be playing a game, and it's a test that he must pass. Today, their role play will be older sister and little brother. Uh-oh. Both the director and Charlotte nervously watch the live feed. Mercedes is a strong-willed woman of focus and commitment, and she may be too much for poor little Shoda. She's like the John Wick of the underground entertainment industry. And with her signature brother-sister roleplay, many boys have been traumatized from its after effects. They begin to wonder if Shoda will just become a shell of himself afterwards. And now we return to the scene of the action. Shoda looks at her, nervously, thinking of what to do next. He references all the anime he's seen in the past, going over what he can and cannot do. He was an only child too, which makes this even more difficult. Fully resolved to carrying the role well, he suddenly cries and runs into her shoulders. Even she's taken aback by this sudden shift. He begs for her time and affection, laying his hands on her eighth wonders of the world in the process. Up next, some back massages. And those do feel extremely relaxing. It's even a little ticklish. Yes, yes, that's a sensitive spot right there. His hands are magical. Even Mercedes can't help but admit it. She's making all sorts of noises now and just melting into his arms. With a thumbs up, she's showing extreme gratification, but Shoda brings it further and asks her to get in a state of nature and lie down. 
time to get to work. Cue the satisfied mules of a freaky muscle mama. Two hours pass like nothing. Despite all that time, Shota's confident that he hasn't pulled out all the stops just yet. He apologizes for taking so long. With this, she stands determinedly, doesn't even bother dressing up, and runs. Her heart and soul can't take it anymore. This is what she's been looking for. When she gets to the receptionist's desk, she goes full on, shut up and take my money mode for an extension. How long? The whole day today. Time to continue. Shota carries on with his magic hands business, and Mercedes's dommy expression melts into a cute one, which he finds adorable. All this is great and all, and the woman's ascending in all sorts of ways, but the same can't be said for Shota, whose weasel's about to go pop. Unfortunately, they can't go all the way since it isn't part of the package, and Mercedes is spent already. So that's when he came up with a brilliant solution, a cat-led massage. Upon seeing his gargantuan gobsmacker, she can't help but compare it to the mighty, legendary creatures she's faced on the battlefield. This sparks something in her that makes her more than willing to perform his request. The director and Charlotte aren't idiots. They know what's happening, but they can't help but watch these events unravel. Like a full-blown MMA fight, it doesn't last for one round. Not two, but three full-length battles. The director is impressed. Three in one day, that's crazy. What she doesn't know is that Charlotte's made it five today, a truly impressive feat. The head maid really admires his ability and is certain that lots of women will surely fall for him in the future. The day ends with some cuddling and one final rodeo after dinner. So much energy. Finally, it's time to depart. Mercedes reassuringly pats Shoda on the head and promises to be back every weekend. He even cries as she leaves. But hey, it'll just be till the next week. This magical book has turned Shoda's dreams into a reality, and it seems that his skill set and approach towards life are heavily rewarded in this alternate universe. He's impressing ladies left and right, but no need to worry, there's enough of his loving to go around. Shoda Ijima was an average boy living an ordinary life until he found a mysterious storybook on the riverbank. He thought it was just some random fantasy book, but little did he know that its contents would awaken something sinister deep inside of him. It's filled with lovely photos for the goons. So to honor the manifesto, our boy decided to call it Erohon Sama. From that point forward, he never failed to shake hands with the president. He did it so frequently that it became as essential as breathing is to him. But on the 1,000th day of his ministrations, he ended up sullying his book. And the next thing he knew, he was in a prison in another world. There, he met a pretty boy named Carl. He proceeded to discover three things. One, Erohan Sama was not isekai'd with him. Two, he's now a slave in a country called Dragon Empire. And three, his black hair and eyes make him stand out and look exotic. Once the slave merchant explained everything to him, Shoda, alongside Carl, was transported to the Valhalla Pipi Mansion, a funhouse belonging to the Empire. On their way there, our boy learned that in the Dragon Empire, men are treated as nothing more than a reproduction and satisfaction tool for women. This was when Shoda realized that the brothel's customers were women. Most slaves shudder in horror upon hearing this, but not Shoda, no, no. Having his pokeballs played by pokemasters was his lifelong dream. He couldn't believe that he would finally be able to have some fun with actual ladies instead of his usual DIY. From there, Shoda met various ladies. Charlotte, the headmaid, Johanna, the vice headmaid, Ursula, the director of the mansion, Hilda, a lolicorn dragonkin, and Mercedes, the newbie crusher. They all have different personalities, but one thing they have in common is their interest in our boy. Luckily for them, he's just as interested in them as they are in him. After Shoda parted ways with his sister, I mean, his customer, he feels a weird sensation coming straight from Netherlands. The next thing he knows, a pissed off Charlotte suddenly comes crawling out from under his blanket, and based on the stuff up her pie hole, it looks like she was real busy. In an irritated tone, she calls him out for thinking about other girls while he's with her. So as punishment, she snuffs the candle for the third time. After that, Shoda proceeds to prepare for his second day on the job. He's about to head out to start his day when he notices that the head maid is looking pensive as if there's something weighing on her mind. Upon being asked, Charlotte shyly advises our boy that kisses should only be done when two people like each other. Granted, she forced him to do it yesterday, but that's why she will try to restrain herself from doing that from now on. This is when she reveals that she won't be visiting him for his daily mouth-to-south resuscitation anymore. They will still see each other anyway, since he will be in the mansion for the next three years. However, the reason she changed her mind is actually much deeper than that. You see, Charlotte felt as though she was filled with some kind of life energy when she first got a taste of the trunk sap. At that moment, she knew she wouldn't be able to keep herself from exploring him. Believe it or not, she wants to save herself for someone she truly loves. So to keep her chastity safe and sanity in check, she decided to distance herself from him. It's the classic case of, it's not you, it's me. 
This news initially breaks Shota's heart. He was having so much fun with all the jobs she had been helping him with, so this saddens him. Still, he tries his best to cheer up. With a smile, he tells the head maid that he will ask Hilda's permission to take her with him when he leaves in three years. Until then, he hopes that she will take good care of him. Charlotte feels her blood rushing to her cheeks as she listens to Shota's heartfelt words. She doesn't know why he would say something heart-thumping to a mere maid like her. It's almost as if he needs her just as much as she needs him. Failing to hold back her emotions, she ends up passionately smooching him. As their lips intertwine, Charlotte decides to make Shota happy no matter what, and that they will be together until the end. Meanwhile, Mikael is acting saltier than usual. He can't believe that the black-haired chick survived his experience with Mercedes. That woman is known as the newbie crusher, yet he seemed to have enjoyed his time with her. Is he sick in the head or something? He then sees the head maid and proceeds to call her attention. Not pleased to be called by Mikael, Charlotte grimaces the moment she lays her eyes on him. She was having such a good day so far. Why must he ruin it? Mikael considers himself the number one doll in the mansion. He also calls himself a pro and the golden boy, along with other equally ridiculous nicknames. Additionally, he hates women and treats the maids poorly. Although many customers order him, he's someone who exploits his authority and has a terrible temperament. In short, Lil Boy is a spoiled brat. Mikael then reveals that he called her to uncover what method Mercedes used on the little black-haired boy she serves. There's no way a plain-faced dwarf like Shota survived the newbie crusher without cheating, right? He's going on and on about how such behavior could tarnish the reputation of the mansion when Charlotte suddenly grabs him by the collar and lifts him in the air. What? Did he really think she'd let him blabber about Shota with his dirty mouth? Mikael may call himself as many nicknames as he wants, but the truth is his pretty face is the only thing he has going for him. He turned down a customer yesterday because he didn't like her face, which ultimately inconvenienced not just the customer, but Ursula and the maids as well. Golden Boy? More like Dookie Boy. As if he isn't infuriating enough, he also dares to talk dirty about Shota, the boy she loves? The nerve. At this point, spoiled little Mikael is in tears. He tries to tell Charlotte that she won't get away with treating him this way. However, she only drops him when Johanna intervenes. She then grabs his hair and warns him never to talk crap about Shota in front of her ever again. If he does, she'll toss him out and let a bunch of female orcas feast on him. Boys who wield two-inch blades like him do not compare even to the dirt under Shota's fingernails. Oh lord, woman. Let's calm down some. Furious and utterly humiliated, Mikael orders the guards to take Charlotte to the director's room. Meanwhile, at the main hall, Hilda chews Mercedes out as she watches her fun time yesterday. She bought Shota for 100,000 gold, yet this female knight did the old horizontal with him without so much as batting an eye. Now, her very expensive boy toy is nothing but a secondhand commodity. With that, she states that she has finally found a worthy opponent. Mercedes is obviously surprised by this sudden turn of events. Though it's evident that she isn't as strong as Hilda, she knows that dying here isn't an option for her either. Shota will be waiting for her next week, and she can't let him be sad about her death. And so, even though she's scared, she exclaims, Let's do this, you damn lolicorn hag! Unbeknownst to Shota, two of the ladies who love him are facing a crisis. As for him, despite his attempts at calling out to the many ladies perusing the goods, he ends up with zero customers for the day. No doubt about it, his road to becoming the most popular toy in this mansion is still very, very long. Going back to Hilda, she tries her best not to laugh at Mercedes's desperate attempts to fight her. She didn't know that this girl would be willing to fight her for the sake of a boy. Nonetheless, Hilda decides to strike a ridiculous pose in an attempt to put an end to her farce. And true enough, Mercedes immediately stops and stares at her. She doesn't know what kind of pose this is, but one thing's for sure. It's cringy as hell. Embarrassed that her joke wasn't received well, Hilda proceeds to reveal the reason for this meeting. She states that from today onwards, Mercedes will be dismissed from her position as the captain of the Imperial Guard, and will now serve the throne as a superior knight for Dragon Scale. Only three people have held this position in the past 3,000 years. Mercedes may have popped the berries of her favorite toy, but she doesn't mind if he has a wife or even concubines. Moving on, Hilda takes out a pudding that Shoda made himself. Believe it or not, he presented it to her, saying he wanted to satisfy his customers in every way possible. How cute is that? Anyway, perhaps it's because she has never tasted a Japanese pudding before or that Shota made it with love, but Hilda is blown away by the deliciousness of the dessert. She has never tasted something like this before. Moreover, this is the first time she has met a man who can charm a woman in this manner. Having said that, she knows that Shota will change the Dragon Empire one day, which is why she wants Mercedes to help him every step of the way. She then gives the knight a bottle of birth control pills that will help her become pregnant more easily. 
With that, the Lil Lady gives Mercedes the go signal to bump uglies with Shota as much as possible so she can give birth to his child. No, she needs to give birth to his children, with emphasis on it being plural. Doing that will preserve his lineage and will lead to him being able to help in rebuilding the empire. Meanwhile, our favorite beige-collared worker is thinking of a way to rise to the ranks to become the best toy in the palace. And how does he plan to do that, you ask? With his knowledge from Japan, of course. You see, this world is unfamiliar with the concept of desserts, meaning the women here have it rough. Oh, Shota simply can't imagine a world without sweets. And so he decides to make pancakes and puddings to woo a hoe with. Once he's finished, he sneaks to Charlotte's room to give her some sweets. She's still being punished, but there's no way he's letting anyone else have the first taste of his cooking. Besides, she's in here because she defended him from Mikal. Bringing her food is the least he can do. With that, Charlotte digs in. As soon as the sweetness hits her tongue, she enters a state of pure euphoria. The pancake is the perfect balance of sweet and soft, and the maple syrup is the cherry on top. Who would have thought that maple tree sap tastes this good? The pudding is just as good, too. Once she's done eating, Shota tells Charlotte that he has prepared another dessert for her. And he actually saved the best for last. As to what it is, let's just say that it's a little something called Flapjack. This, he says, is her reward for standing up for him against Mikal. Eager for more sweets, Charlotte springs into action and digs in. Outside her door, the other maids are having a hard time containing themselves after being summoned by the sound of Shota's cute sounding. The next day, a very tall lady minotaur enters the Valhalla Peepee -pee mansion in search of a doll who will take away her maiden tag. Though she has her reservations, she wonders if she will meet her soulmate here. As for Shota, Johanna wakes him up, saying Ursula is calling him. He's still tired from last night's steamy affairs, but he pulls through, thinking that something amazing is going to happen to him today. Yep, he's claiming it. Today's his day. Or at least that's what he thought. For whatever reason, the mansion lobby is filled with irate customers and injured guards lying on the floor. Shota asks Mikael about what happened. Why is everyone on edge? Why are the customers mad? And why are there so many injured guards? With his voice quivering, Mikael reveals that a customer went crazy earlier but has now been arrested. Ever the narcissist, he adds that as long as he, the golden boy, doesn't get hurt, then everything is fine. Though Mikael claims that things are now settled, Shota can't help but worry about the state of the mansion. And as someone who works here, he wants to do something to help de-escalate the situation. First, he helps the beaten up guard he sees lying on the ground. Now, it's time to calm the angry customers. To do that, our boy stands on the front desk, calls everyone's attention, and declares, We apologize for the disturbance, but rest assured that we are opening today as usual. We always try to provide the best service, so please tell us if you need anything. Spoken like a true corporate slave. Thankfully, this does the trick. Not only that, the other customers are now interested in Shota as well. Two birds with one stone, eh? Moving forward, he advises the maids at the front desk to call him should any more Karens arrive. Just like that, our boy rizzed some more mansion maids. But before he can even relish in his newfound popularity, Johanna grabs him by the ear and takes him to see Ursula. The customer who caused all this havoc is with her right now, and she wants our boy's help in figuring things out. Before long, the two arrive at the director's office, and there, Shota sees the crying lady Minotaur. She looks like the Terminator at first glance, a relentless killing machine. However, our boy finds her cute. Moreover, she's got Parabolas for days. Her body is different from the other girls in the mansion, but it has its own elegance and charm. And her pheromones? Oh man, they're spreading around in the room, fully enticing him. All in all, she's got the textbook definition of the true beauty of an adult woman. Our sleazy boy can only imagine all the unholy things he can do in her majestic landscape. Meanwhile, this Lil Goner with a double O is going feral over the possibilities. His reverie is then interrupted when Ursula explains that Gretel, the Minotaur, had already paid 1,000 silver coins for Mikael, but he refused. According to him, he's too handsome to serve a Minotaur. So no, he will not play with her no matter how much she offers. Gretel can only cry on the side over the unfortunate turn of events. She was optimistic when she came here, hopeful that someone would be willing to accept her. However, she was clearly wrong. She's nothing more than a monster in the eyes of humans. Frankly speaking, this ostracization isn't new to her. She's used to getting bullied and being called names, but she had a sliver of hope when she came here. That's why it made her lose her rationality when she heard Mikael insult her. Of course, none of this would have happened if she didn't dare to be accepted. Hearing that last bit breaks Shota's heart, and he promptly asserts that none of this is Gretel's fault. Every guy dreams of being dommed by a tall, bodacious, and muscular mommy like her. So if anything, Mikael isn't normal. Shota is suggesting that they chop his family jewels when he suddenly realizes that he's crying. 
how it pains him to see a beautiful woman like Gretel crying over a loser like Mikael. As such, he asks that she let him treat her broken heart. Following his oration, Ursula tells Gretel that she highly recommends Shota. Though it hasn't happened yet, she's certain he will take the number one spot in the mansion in the near future. He may be a newbie, but his satisfaction rate is 100% thus far. Hearing this, Gretel wonders why Shota is crying in the first place. Seeing how empathetic he is, she reckons that she wouldn't feel this crappy had she chosen him from the beginning. That aside, she's scared of being in pain again. She's a minotaur, so chances are high that he only said those sweet nothings to appease her, a customer. But much to her surprise, Shota exclaims that everyone is equal in front of a man with culture. Lolicorns, skinny, tomboys, curvy, femboys. Everything is fine with him. Gretel worriedly retorts that she hasn't showered in the past three days, but our boy simply tells her that they can bathe together. She need not worry about her body when she's with him because, as he said, everyone is equal to him. And to prove his point, he grabs her hand and lets her touch his sword. What did I tell ya? Man of culture. With that, Gretel finally agrees and the two head to a special room Ursula prepared for her as compensation. Contrary to her sad demeanor earlier, Gretel is now all smiles as she explores the room. As for Shota, he can't help but feel honored to serve such a beautiful woman. That said, it's now time for them to get clean. Shota takes his time helping her with it. If it were up to him, he'd do things fast, but knowing that this is Gretel's first time with a man, he sees to it that she relishes the experience. And based on the sounds she makes, it's clear that she's enjoying this as much as he does. This truly is the happiest moment in Gretel's life. Feeling impatient, our boy takes things to the next level by tasting what's cooking in her oven. And almost instantly, she gets a clam cramp that sends him flying. This is when it dawns on Shota how lonely Gretel must have been. He hasn't done much, yet she is already at her peak. Of course, that doesn't mean their playtime is over. The fun has only just begun. As such, he asks what she wants him to do next. We aim to please in this mansion. This gets Gretel thinking for a good few seconds. Then, when she finally breaks her silence, she reveals that she wants to taste his, well, peach bellini. Needless to say, Shota is flabbergasted, astounded. Meanwhile, Ursula snickers as she watches her star performing his duties well. Seeing Charlotte's stunned reaction, she explains that beast races like getting a whiff of their partner's O-ring and tasting it is basically a marriage proposal. Minotaurs are an aggressive race in general, but females are the ones who usually go berserk when doing the rodeo. With that in mind, Ursula and Charlotte wait to see what happens next. Going back to Shota, his mind gets filled with a sense of fear and shame upon hearing the Minotaur's request. This is not at all what he was expecting. What happened to good old Vanilla? Still, he knows he isn't in the position to refuse since he's the one who suggested that they do what she wants. With that, he let it be, let it be. And strangely enough, he's into it. Well, you know what they say, don't knock it till you try it. When Shota gathers his bearings, he finds Gretel kneeling before him. Fun fact, boy. Lady Minotaurs are the ones who lead the tangos. Suffice it to say that it's one hell of a experience. Gretel's simply incomparable when it comes to rodeos, and Shota even passes out the moment the volcano erupted. Now that's what you call a banger. Once their time is up, Gretel carries Shota outside and hands him to Ursula. The pancakes and puddings she had earlier were amazing, but he's far beyond that. He gave her a pleasant time that she won't forget anytime soon. Of course, none of this would have happened had Ursula kicked her out for going berserk. And for that, she's thankful. She then gives the director a thousand silver coins. This is all the money she has, but the experience she had was worth every penny. Sadly, Shota will probably have been promoted by the time she returns, meaning she won't be able to play with him anymore. There's also the fact that he has to leave in three years. As much as she wants to spend more time with him, she knows that won't happen. So instead, she wishes to at least bear his child. Just then, Gretel notices a tree being guarded in the mansion garden. As per Ursula, it's a maple tree, and its sap is being collected to be used as an ingredient for making pancakes. Hilda has taken a liking to the syrup it secretes, and wants it to be guarded since there's only one of its kind in the entire imperial capital. Intrigued, Gretel reveals that there are hundreds of maple trees in her village. In fact, there's a whole forest of it. And because it's not ideal for woodwork, it hasn't been touched for a long time. Upon hearing this, Ursula excitedly asks if she could sell them the tree sap. The Empire will buy them all and even pay gold coins in return. Just like that, the mansion now has a steady supply of maple syrup. But more importantly, Gretel will be able to pay Shota a visit every Monday. That night, Hilda meets with an alchemist named Dorothea and tells her all about Shota. The boy has black hair and eyes, is not afraid of women, and, most importantly, has the biggest bratwurst she has ever seen. Truly, she has found the most incredible boy toy there is. 
He's also the most expensive out of everyone in the mansion, proving that he couldn't be beaten even if others tried. With him around, she's certain that the Empire's birth rate will increase, and the Dragon Empire will finally be great again. His seed must be passed on to every woman, and that's where Dorothea comes in. As the greatest alchemist in history, Hilda wants her to give Shota the power that will turn him into a hungry beast, one that would make him see every woman as his prey. After much consideration, Dorothea agrees to Hilda's request. As such, she wonders if the famous black-haired boy will be able to endure the ritual she will prepare for him. The next day, at the cafeteria, Ursula calls Shota and tells him that from now on, he will be promoted from the human level to the ground level. Newbies like him usually have to be trained at the human level for three months, but doing that won't be beneficial to the mansion. Besides, Ursula knows how much he likes doing the no-pants dance, even though it's technically not allowed on his floor. No worries, though, because she isn't here to punish him. In fact, she promises that if he climbs to the god level, she will give him a gift, one that will allow him to do whatever he wants with her for a day. Upon hearing this, Shota instantly gets fired up. A no-holds-barred gift from Ursula? Sign this boy up. He's been wanting to do the polka with her the moment he saw her, so there's no way he's letting this opportunity pass. That said, she asks him to head to her office after breakfast. Once she's gone, the other boys in the cafeteria proceed to gossip about Shota. Some of them aren't pleased about his promotion, but Carl, the first friend he made here, is very happy for him. It has now been two weeks since our boy got isekai in this world. The other boys in the mansion harbor an excessive disdain towards women, and though they don't admit it, they seem to have an intimate relationship with each other. Shota doesn't dig sword fights, but it's thanks to them that he gets to have as many women as he wants in his fellowship. The only downside to this is his body isn't as strong as his drive, but that's a problem for another time. For now, he heads to the director's office. Upon entering, Shota sees a mysterious woman sitting across from Ursula. Though he can barely see her face, he's certain that she's pretty based on the aura she gives off. White hair and red lips. Yep, no doubt about it. This girl is stunning for sure. True enough, the time goes from 6 o'clock to 12 the moment he sees her face. Before long, Ursula introduces the woman as Dorothea. I mean Dorothy, and states that she's a magician and is Hilda's friend. The latter then studies Shota and notes that despite her long life, he's the first boy she's seen with black hair and eyes. To top it all off, he's interested in women, whereas most men despise them. Having said that, she believes he's a man deserving of her greatest masterpiece. Dorothy then takes out a tear-shaped gem and states it's the greatest magic item she has ever created. It's made of Hilda, I mean of dragon blood, so naturally its name is dragon blood. As such, she wants him to swallow it in one go. What Shota doesn't know is that Dorothy went to arduous lengths to make this stone and that if it's consumed, even ordinary humans will gain the power of the dragon race. That is, if they get through the excruciating pain. At first, Shota is hesitant to swallow the bloodstone, but after some reverse psychology courtesy of Dorothy, he eventually ingests it in one go. A few seconds pass and he feels searing pain throughout his entire body, causing him to scream out in agony. As he writhes on the ground, Ursula tries to encourage him by saying that she will let him do as he pleases with her parabolas if he gets through this. This disgusts Dorothy. I mean, what kind of man would be thinking of that while he's in pain? But much to her astonishment, Shota responds to Ursula and says that her melons aren't enough. With that, the director throws in Dorothy's own on the deal as well. Surprisingly, this is all the motivation our boy needs to get through the pain. It's all about choosing the right bribery. Meanwhile, Dorothy marvels at the scene unfolding before her. She can't believe it. She can see mana thrashing around Shota's body. But more than that, she can't believe that this is happening because of his love for Maracas. Who would have thought that he'd be able to subdue such immense power over such a petty reason? Whatever the case, Shota's body now has the power of the Dragonborn. He may have thought that his life took a turn when he entered this world, but that will seem minuscule to the change he's about to experience. With his new power, the possibilities for him are now endless. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.